Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to another bonus episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where we bring you conversations with experts in fields relating to urban farming and dive a little deeper into some of the important issues of our times. Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWANTTOSAVESEEDS.COM and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. Today in this bonus podcast, we have the November 2017 Seed Class, where our seed expert Bill McDormand shares some seed wisdom and discusses thoughts and concerns that might occupy the thoughts of those of us that are interested in saving seeds. Welcome, Bill. Hello, hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here as always. This is great. I always love getting your ears. At least once a month, I get to have a good <sighs> chat with you. So We've got a long and storied friendship, and it just keeps getting deeper. And yeah. I invite everyone to join us once a month as we renew our friendship, you know, yeah. and, and talk about the important things that are going on. So Yeah. So let's just jump in. What are the important things that are going on? If you're a seed person, I assume that you like to grow food. And good, at least or, for part of it. Well, or, you know, some people are flower like, people. Or you like to grow yeah. seeds. Some people like to grow seeds. Right. One of the most astounding announcements happened last week. Wow. In my life in the Mountain West, and especially in the Southwest, trying to grow food. And there was an article in High Country News is where I read about it. It may have been released somewhere else. But a researcher at Utah State University, Lizbeth Lauderbeck, has been doing studies in archaeological digs that are 11,000 years old in the Four Corners area. And in the fire pits, they were analyzing everything in it, and they found a starch, the remains of a starch that they just couldn't identify. It wasn't corn. It wasn't squash. It wasn't beans. You know, it wasn't any of the other things that have been found as foods in and around these kinds of sites. They had it analyzed, and shock of shocks, it's potato. 11,000 years ago, people were eating potatoes. And so they started asking. It threw everybody kind of off to the side a bit, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh -huh. And long story short, they ended up finding a 94-year-old man alive in the Four Corners area who reputedly knew something about it. Somebody said, why don't you go talk to this old guy? And they did. And he remembered digging up little cherry-sized potatoes from these areas that were what they thought were left over, you know, from the Anasazi or whatever, during the Great Depression. It's one of the things that kept the family fed. And as a little boy, he was sent out to dig potatoes. So he said, well, you know, I can tell you where the places were. And they went out and they found them. And so they've analyzed them, and they are not Solanum tuberosum, which is the plant that we all eat as potatoes. Right. It's a different species of potato known as Solanum jamesii. And they got some, and they're starting to do studies. I wrote immediately to Dr. Lauterbach asking for either some of the potatoes or seeds. Flowers actually do produce seeds. So exciting new you know, breakthrough in trying to grow food here in the Southwest. I can't believe that there's a native Four Corners area potato. How's that sound? That it persisted without any care, you know, yeah. since the Great Depression. That's phenomenal. For those of us that are kind of thinking, well, so this is epic, number one. Number two, why is it epic? Potatoes weren't grown in the Four Corners area. They came from well, South America, right? Right. Okay. That's what we think. And we mm -hmm. think that they came way later. Got it. There's nothing written about potatoes, you know, being part of the food. And so it's just this shocking rediscovery. You know, and it seems like maybe we shouldn't be surprised because we're finding all sorts of new things in archaeological digs and using DNA and, you know, the combination of all the tools we have. Now we're learning a lot about, you know, where humans came from and where they actually persisted. And so this is just part of that deepening picture, I guess. Yeah. So anyway, I'm looking forward to having potatoes. Corn, I know corn, squash, and beans grow here, especially in right. the summer. Now, I'm an Idaho boy originally. I can have <laughs> potatoes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just not surprising that we would mm -hmm. find other kinds of plants that are as of yet undiscovered, because that's really what it is. It's an undiscovered mm -hmm. plant. Yes. 
And, you know, just to, to fill in because we should stay focused on seeds, some of these potatoes, this Philanum jamesi, are, are producing seeds they think are quite true. In other words, though, you plant the seeds, you know, they have a little tomato type flower and then mm-hmm. fruit on them. And then you can save those seeds planted and get whole new plants that grow potatoes, which is unlike the Solanum tuberosums that we have these days, right. which have been so selected and so hybridized that you never get, really get potatoes. Or if you do, they don't look anything like the ones. Mm-hmm. That you know that you grew in the beginning, and that's why you never see you know potato seed for sale. And so, as a seed person, this is really exciting. If we could you know have a Southwest desert adapted potato seed in our seed libraries and seed exchanges, mm-hmm. I just think that would be a really exciting thing. Especially if you were able to grow it from seed as well as the seed. Right. Potato. Yeah. Right. And so, again, I don't know all the testing and they've just this story was just released. And so we'll see what happens. But wow, I just love it when stuff like this happens. We don't know what is going on out there totally. (laughs) Yeah. So is that Solanum G-A-I-N-J-I? Gain G-I? No, James I-I. Ah. James okay, with cool. two little eyes, James the eyes. That's one way of saying it. I'm sure there's others. Yeah. So you can look that up. There's stories now starting to break, I think, on the Internet, and I've heard other people talking about it. But coming to a store near you, huh? Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. It's already on Wikipedia. It's a species of nightshade. Its range includes southern United States. All parts of the plant, especially the fruit, are toxic. Oh, that's interesting. Immature tuber roots are edible. Okay. There you go. Yeah, it's the tuber roots that are edible. Yeah, people have been eating it. They were eating it 11,000 years ago. They did find evidence of that. So Right, and for the solanium, that's not unheard of. I mean, the plants are poisonous. It's the right. you know the tomatoes that you want to eat or the eggplants that you want to eat or the you know the potatoes that you want to eat. Yeah, it's, it's cool. So anyway, that got me all excited this week and yeah. looking at things. You know, one of the other things that's just happened is that one of the great seedsmen in the Mountain West passed away this summer of cancer. Mm-hmm. His name was was Ampatu. He was actually I got to meet him a couple of years ago. He was an acupuncturist in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Got disillusioned with modern life, so to speak, and headed for the hills. They said he lived around 8,000 feet in Hotchkiss, Colorado, mm. kind of up on the mountain. And he started trying to grow his own food, sort of retreated, and he systematically searched through grains, especially, so he could subsist up there, and vegetables from all over the world for over a 25-year period, growing and wow. saving his own seeds. And so I went up and tried to find out what happened to his seeds and was able to bring back eight buckets full of seeds. And I'm proud to announce I've just had a couple of helpers from one of my green school classes mm-hmm. come by. In the last two days, we've been cataloging what I brought, and we're going to soon release about 150 new grains into our heritage grain trials. From him? That amp- from him. There are foxtail Whoa. millet. There are Tibetan barleys. There's Highland Nepalese rice. There's all these things that I've never heard of before that are just beautiful grains. There's black barley, bronze barley, purple, as I said, Tibetan barley. I can't mm-hmm. remember all. I've, it's just been a, a whirlwind trying to go through these lists and quinoas and amaranths. And so anyway, if you're interested in getting access to this and helping us to see if it grows where you grow, Mm-hmm. and helping us to increase the seeds, then join with the other 60 people in our network, in the Rocky Mountain Seeds Heritage Grain Trials Network, that have signed up to do this. And so we'll send you the seeds. There's online forms where you can put the information that you get when you grow them. And then if and when you can, we ask you to return twice as many seeds as we sent you. Mm-hmm. And that way we can send them out to other people. And that way we can quickly, you know, throughout our whole region, figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't. And yeah. and we, for those of you in the south, we count the Rocky Mountains going all the way down into the Sierra Madre in Mexico. If you look at a, a map of the earth, we're on that western spine of mountains going all the way up into Canada also. Right. So, yeah, help us out and join in. It's like Christmas, Greg. <laughs> it's just like a big treasure hunt, you know, opening wow. up these buckets going, wow, look at this. Look at that. I just love it. I've never, you know, gotten over my excitement for seeds. For seeds, yeah. Let's talk about that. You brought up that, you know, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is doing seed trials. Is it only grain trials or seed trials as well? Well, we've got about 200 of what we call seed stewards. Uh And these are people of varying, you know, expertise and experience, but they've agreed to step up 
and be a point person in their communities. And they've agreed to at least grow and save one thing that they're stewarding. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to our site now and you can pull up a directory for all of our seed stewards and a map, and you can see them all, the whole map, and you can click on the little buttons on the map and see who it is and get their email and communicate with them directly. Wow. So this whole network of people are starting to talk to each other, you know, find each other, and then exchange seed. That part goes way beyond grains. That goes into everything that people are growing. But in particular now, we have what we call the Rocky Mountain Heritage Grain Trials, which is a more formal and organized attempt to build local grain economies again. By looking back to the grains that were used before the industrial era mm -hmm. that brought lots of irrigated water and lots of chemicals so that we can build a more resilient and closer to home grain economy. And so we've got, you know, well, until we brought Amplitude's grains back, we had about 140 grains. You know, going back, you know, we have einkorn, which goes back maybe 40,000 years. Mm -hmm. We've got emmer and spelt and triticale and amaranths and quinoas and so but we don't have very much seed turns out that many of these things you know are in short supply that were you know so important especially in the western united states well all over the country you know up until world war ii and so we're trying to find the ones that worked in each of the areas the old ones and sometimes we only get like 50 seeds or five grams. And so we're passing those out to the people in our network, these 60 people that have signed up to do this. You know, we have a pretty intensive forum on our website now that you can use to enter data about your grain growing, but you don't have to. If you want to help us and just grow one grain, and all you have to do is grow one plant actually would help us in a pot sometimes because, you know, one or two grains in a pot will yield hundreds, you know, and we could use those. Because then we'll send them out to other people. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be complicated. And the first year you do it, the only real data that we ask you, that we you know, require, so to speak, from people is, would you grow the grain again? Yes or no question. Mm -hmm. Did it work for you where you are in the conditions that you did? If you did, can you return some seeds to us? Well, it's a real simple thing for the first year because we're just trying to get it increased. And then, you know, if you increase your own seed and go on and grow out a larger amount the next year, then you can start answering more questions like how long did it take to germinate? How many seeds did you get from each head average? Those sorts of things that can help us, you know, build a profile for the grain for farmers Right. later. We're going to start doing acreage, and they're going to want all the data they can get. And so we're just a, you know, grassroots volunteer network of people that say, you know, it might be really important for our regions to be producing their own grains here, you know, just yeah. looking at the horizon of what's going on. And so we're, you know, it's not doom and gloom. It's actually exciting, you know, to get involved in grains. They're so beautiful. So anyway, that's the Rocky Mountain Heritage Grain Trials. Perfect. You know, I really highly encourage those people listening out there to, you know, jump in and play with this because we have a thriving local ancient grain economy here in the Valley of the Sun here in the Phoenix metropolitan area because of some work you did about, what, eight years ago, Bill? Oh, it started about six years ago, actually, is all it yeah. took. We turned a couple of handfuls of white Sonoran wheat into 1,100 acres, you know, in relatively short time, you know, because there's a market for it now. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that with it, the older grains like einkorn and emmer, way less gluten sensitivity right. for people. You know, I don't know how many millions of people are waking up with gut problems. And they may not have celiacs, but, you know, their doctors, a lot of doctors now are saying cut back on the gluten. Oh, yeah. And you could cut back on how gluten affects you because there's still gluten in wheat. Mm -hmm. But these older wheats, it just, I guess the term I've learned now is gluten tides are different. Uh, and once you eat sourdough bread, where the leavening process over a 24-hour period changes those gluten tides even more. Right. So if you're eating einkorn or emmer that's been prepared as sourdough bread, eat away. Even celiac patients have been known now to be able to eat it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the underlying drivers of this popularity, this resurgence in popularity. And, well, it just keeps dollars in our local economy, right? I mean, up until the local grain economy got restarted in southern Arizona, the only real wheat that was being grown was Durham. And the majority of that was being shipped to Italy to make pasta. Really? It could be shipped, you know. Durham is semolina is another uh, word that's been used. Yeah. So, you know, how good is that for the economy? We so they, like they, grow it, they grow it here. Yeah. They they ship it there, 
make pasta and they ship it back to us. They ship the finished products in Whole Foods and in the grocery stores here. Yeah. I'm going to throw yeah. something at you, Bill. Yeah. I've been to your place up in Cornville, and you know you've got a you know fair amount of garden space to grow there. And here at the Urban Farm, I have a third of an acre, and on that third of an acre, I probably have 8,000 square feet that I grow food in. Mm-hmm. And you know I've kind of been playing with this whole idea of what it would take to grow most of my groceries that I buy in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, from a seed perspective, your thoughts on that. Oh, I was just at Rebecca Newburn's house in Richmond, California, and she has a smaller lot than you do, Greg. Mm -hmm. And she's now up to about 70% of her groceries. She's growing on her. You know, she's had to change her diet. Oh, yeah. And she does a lot of canning, you know, and Mm -hmm. drying dehydration to get through periods when she, you know food isn't being produced and she's in California that would be somewhat similar you could grow greens and all sorts of stuff through the winter oh yeah it's a really interesting thing now the hard part is to grow the calories right right about 70% of our calories as on uh, this is an average overall so don't you know somebody could probably attack it but generally 70% of our calories it's thought of come from grains either we eat the grains themselves or they're fed to animals that we Mm -hmm. then eat. And so that's what you need to start growing some. And actually, I've never been more excited. I think on two or 300 square foot beds, I can grow enough of Dia de San Juan, which is the corn now that I've chosen to grow for my tortillas Mm -hmm. for the year. Mm-hmm. I can grow just about enough. I'll see next year, you know, so that doesn't take up that much room. And I'm going to grow. I've got, you know, about an acre of usable ground here. Right. You know, but it's all going to be in 100 or 75 square foot beds. Right. Beds. I don't I don't have fields. This is all going to be gardened. But I'm going to grow enough einkorn next year to make bread through the year. That's what that's my grain now. I love it. I just made a loaf again today. My mm-hmm. wife who is gluten sensitive can eat it with me. It is 42% more protein, way higher in minerals. It's way more drought tolerant. It's beautiful. That's what I want. So, I'm yeah. going to figure out a way to do that on my property. So, I'm I'm really I've never been more excited. So, let me just repeat back what I heard you say. You're going to grow enough corn and enough wheat. That's your plan for next year, to grow enough corn and wheat for you and Bell for the year, for your yeah. bread and tortilla needs. Yeah. You know, two ears of corn will twice a week. I need four ears, four big ears of corn a week. I can make corn, fresh ground corn tortillas twice a week. Then they last in the fridge for another few days. I mean, it is right. phenomenal how productive corn agriculture is. I just had this aha moment when I went, oh, that's why everybody did it. And it created such surplus. You know, the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec all built empires. They had yeah. so much food. You know, why aren't we doing that? You know, so I'm going to try. You know, I may get defeated and I'll let you know, but I, I, before I'm done, I'll figure it out. I'd like to document this because one of the things that I'm looking at here in the Valley long term, so there's, for those of you that aren't in the Phoenix metropolitan area, there's 4.4 million people in this area. And my goal before I die is to turn it into a regenerative <laughs> food economy. You know, can we build out enough food and grow enough food here or build the infrastructure and then grow enough food in our yards to feed Phoenix. And I realize that's a (laughs) long shot, but hey, why not? I'm a what if kind of guy. And I would be really curious to document your process and your ideas throughout that. Yeah, sure. I think Um, that's the plan. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm, I'm excited about that. That is cool. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, I have a long ways to go, but it's going to take, you know, I've been gone in the summers away from my place for the last six years, Mm -hmm. you know, working on building Native Seed Search and then the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And so this year I was back home and getting the beds back, getting the organic matter in. So it may take a bit. You know, it's something we have to do is what I would say. We're going to have hundreds of millions of climate refugees soon wandering around outside our cities, if nothing else, unless we bring them in, bring them into our country, Mm -hmm. you know, supply. My lines are going to be shortened because of climate change and storms, if nothing else. You know, we're, we've been on the verge of a number of pandemics. First thing that will happen if there's any worldwide pandemic is they'll shut borders down so our whole global food network won't happen. Oh my I God. just think it's smart. I don't want to scare people. I just think it's smart. Yeah. And then it's better. Then we're Tuscany. You know, you have yeah. food that no one else in the world has because you grew it there, and it's your varieties, and we're saving the seeds. 
I just read something, Greg, that might interest you, and I'll send you a link. I could we could put it on your on our thing. If the United Nations now estimates that one fifth, twenty percent of all the food that's feeding people on the planet is already grown in cities. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. the newest estimate. We know that Phoenix could get up to twenty percent. Yeah. Easy, probably. Yeah. So now, you know, then we have to start maybe making some structural. You'd have to do some zoning changes probably. But, hey, it's doable, I think. Yeah. I really do. It's really all about experimenting. Jump in, plant yeah. something, experiment, play with it a little bit, see what works. You know, and if you kill something, yay. You Now you know what doesn't work. Try something else. <laughs> exactly. We, there's some myths getting in the way. One is that you need a farm here in the Verde Valley just bought a – they wanted to grow barley, and I think they have three acres of barley. And they bought a 26-foot head combine. And three acres, we could have all volunteered and done it by hand, you know? Yeah. Had a party for the day, right? Right, and and then he could have tried, you know, dozens of different kinds of barley and kept them separate and see which one works better before you know you expand a huge scale. But generally, we think you need large scale to do grains, and nothing could be further from the truth. You can grow enough oats. I'm going to grow enough oats next year too. I'm getting a little oat roller for forty dollars, mm-hmm. so I can roll my own oat flakes for you know oatmeal. And I figure in about an eighty foot row that's a foot wide, I'm going to grow enough oats, hullus oats for myself for the whole year too. That's just part of my plan. So I've got my wow. breakfast. You know, I'm going to have my bread. Yep. I'm going to have my corn tortillas, and then we're going to put beans everywhere. So you know. Oh well, they they grow wild in my yard. Yeah, no, that, and then maybe even some potatoes now. You know, this is going to be good. But let's, we got to get over these myths. You know, and the other one, as I mentioned earlier, is that, oh, it's a lot of work and you just don't get very much from corn. Uh uh. You grow a good plant or flower corn that's adapted here to the Southwest in a relatively short place, small place, you can grow a tremendous amount of food. As I said, two large ears of corn is enough to feed your family, probably. For the day, once you, you know, cook it, I, I cook mine in the solar cooker. I nixtamalize it first, which is an old Aztec, you know, method of yep. cooking with ash or lime to bring mm-hmm. the flavor out. And then we grind it in a little hand grinder and make fresh corn tortillas. <laughs> One of the other statistics, and I just heard this from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, is that it may be that up to 45% of the nutrition in corn and grains is gone within 24 hours after you mill it, oh, after right. you break that skin. Yep. It's all the volatile oils. You know, they oxidize. Things mm-hmm. change immediately. So that's what we're doing. So, you know, I may never be able to grow enough, you know, bulk commodity flour and those other things I would need to live here. But I don't need as much because the food I'm eating is fresh. It's fresh milled and fresh ground. And so it's just hugely nutrient dense. Isn't that the term they're starting to use these days? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be good. Wow. I'm excited about it too, especially to document it as we go. Because yes. that that information is invaluable. If we can figure out how to feed a family of four on 3,000 square feet, growing the grains the way you're talking about, which it sounds like we can. You know, and it may be that in Phoenix, you know, we've got 100-year-old farms around Phoenix. I'm not sure how long they'll have water, Mm -hmm. you know, because the canal water to farmers gets cut first in Arizona. Yeah. And Arizona gets cut first if Lake Mead goes down below a certain level, you know. Right. But that's not what I'm talking about. I actually grow most of my food here on city water. I know. And that's what – I know that's what it means. But, you know, if we had drought-tolerant white Sonoran Mm -hmm. and more drought-tolerant einkorn and grow them as winter grains Mm -hmm. so you don't have to put a lot of water on, you know, a few fields in and around Phoenix, you know, to provide bulk amounts – of these foods to people would be certainly within the realm of possibilities well, and then have people in their own yards grow those things they can grow best. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, we have Pinnacle Farms here in Phoenix growing several different kinds of wheat quite successfully. You know, there's the people over at Hayden Flour Mill mm-hmm. who's, you know, working with farmers in, you know, in the East Valley growing the grain. So, you know, we, we've got a healthy grain growing economy here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so what I would say to people is start with stuff you can pick and eat year-round, you know, things you eat every day. Start easy with the salads and and stuff, you know, and your greens. I mean, that's everybody could do that and hugely lessen the impact that we all have on the world. Right now, I just read another article today, I think it was in the Washington Post, that the industrial food system is the most destructive thing happening environmentally. 
And it's not just dead zones. You know, it's CO2. It's, well, you could go on and on. And so to get yourself outside of that stream, if you want to be, you know, a responsible citizen, that's what we should be doing, finding a way to be more healthy environmentally and changing and growing a little bit of your own food could be the best thing you do. Yeah. Experiment. Here's what I tell people all the time. Grow herbs. They're the easiest things to grow. Oh, yeah. And the most expensive thing to buy. There you go. You know, you you pay $6 for two ounces of organic cilantro. Yeah. You know, even if it's $4 for two ounces, that's still outrageous. And we've got, you know, I've got some nice cilantro plants growing in my yard right now. Yeah. And I put, I do, a, I do a green drink every morning and I go out in the yard and I pick some mint and, yeah. you know, the mint goes in. So I'm going to make it through the winter drinking tea. I've got mint and lavender and all sorts of stuff. Lavender, mint, I'm trying to think of the other ones I have. I did enough oregano. They're perennials. Once you get them going, all you have to do is harvest them occasionally, dry them out, and you've got enough for the winter. Right. It's great. Yeah. I got a hedge of rosemary and a hedge of oregano here. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes sense in your case. You know, the old, if you look at Culpeper's Herbal, uh huh. rosemary thrives where women are powerful in the household. <laughs> oh, just... there you go. <laughs> well, that is the case here. That is the case here for sure. Yeah. So what else about seeds, Bill? Why don't we chat? What have you guys got coming up with Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance? And anybody that's interested on the live event, which is happening right now, if you want to shoot us your questions over in the Q&A on the right-hand side. We also put these up as podcasts later. So if you're listening to the podcast, sorry, there's no Q&A. But you can shoot me your questions over there. But what have you guys got coming up? I've just been really busy. I was just at Arcosante giving a talk. I did. We did a grain school in a day up in Norwood, Colorado that was incredibly successful. And so we're going to kind of wind down as far as events and things here for a little while. Mm -hmm. But that being said, our annual grain school is coming up January 12th through the 14th at the University of Colorado, Colorado oh, yeah. Springs. Mm -hmm. We've got some of the best people in the world coming, Craig Finley. Steve Jones from the Bread Lab, which is really famous oh. on the West Coast. And we've got Glenn Roberts from Anson Mills, mm -hmm. maybe the godfather of the whole local grain movement. This guy's wow. done more to get things going nationwide. And he's just a character. He is an entertaining, surprising explorer. And so we're really excited to have both those guys. Don Guerra from Tucson and Barrio Bread's coming back to teach everybody how to make bread. Oh, if you have nice. any interest in grains at all, whether you're a brewer, a maltster, a baker, a grower, or an eater, this is the place to go. We've got two of the professors there will give us lectures on the latest on glyphosate and grains and mm. diets and one on gluten. What has happened in the past year as far as scientific studies around grains and gluten? And we'll get that lecture. So, so that's a really great thing. And we still have room for people to do that. And then we're going to do another seed school teacher training in Denver, Colorado in April, April 22nd, oh. 27th. And you know what we're going to do, Greg? You've seen that we've been through probably 40 seed schools. We oh, yeah. started doing the seed school teacher trainings, and we've had over 60 graduates now of those. Seed We've done School three Online. Of those. We got, oh, you're, of course, Seed School Online. In fact, Seed School Online was so successful this year for us with our Seed School Teacher Training we did. We required it. Before you come to Seed School Teacher Training, you need to go through Seed School Online. And we really didn't know how that was going to work out. Right. But we wanted everybody to come with the content so that we could all practice how to teach. So we cut way back on presenting content this time. Maybe a third, you know, to 40% of the time was the things we wanted people to really cement in their minds. We did those things again. I think there were six executive directors of nonprofits nationally who came mm -hmm. and three county extension agents who already teach. These guys are, you know, it was incredible. So feedback at the end of Seed School Teacher Training this fall was that next time you guys do this, no content. And require everyone to do Seed School Online. Yeah. Content, it's good. They yeah. said, it's good. Just do that. And then open up a week for all of us, people who want to teach about seeds, to come and let us run the whole week. We'll facilitate <laughs> it and we'll practice and we'll deliver all the content ourselves. Yeah. You guys don't have to do anything. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, that's a really great idea. That is regenerative, it's be man. Spend all week teaching. Yeah. You know, what's wrong with that? 
and we'll be there to give feedback. Yep. So that our next teacher training is going to be that way. We're just giving away the store. If you want to come and practice for a week on being a seed teacher with some of the best people from around the United States, with some of the best content, come. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be great. I'm <laughs> really looking forward to it. Wow, what an evolution. No you know? kidding. Wow, from 2010 when you did this first seed school up in Cornville. Right. Yeah, that was epic when Toby was there and Steve yep. Peter and Gary Nabin came and God, that was, yeah, it's been a long, long journey and now we're just about to turn it over. Once we get these seed school teacher trainings going with people that are going to spend a week teaching, they will have enough experience to go out and start doing their own seed schools and that's what we want and some of our students already are. Good. It's great. It's the exponential is starting to happen. Yeah. Gives me great hope, you know. This is going to be good. Oh, <laughs> it's going to yes. be just in time, <laughs> as we like to say. Yeah, exactly. Let me check and see if anybody's thrown us any questions. I know either I, I see you all out there. You know, your questions can be really specific. Yeah. About seed saving, about teaching, about information, about sources. All seed knowledge is local. <laughs> yeah. So, Steve, we got a, a question from Steve in Casper, Wyoming. He said, will there be a seed summit in 2018? And if so, where will it be? There will not be in this winter. Summit time is winter time or early spring before everybody's actually planting and doing seeds. So we've decided to emulate or mimic the Organic Seed Alliance conferences, which are every other year. Yeah. And so if you want to go to a really great conference with, you know, three or four hundred, I mean, there's going to be over 500 people there this year, probably. It's in Corvallis, Oregon, the weekend during Valentine's Day. I think it's like the 12th through the 14th. So in respect to that, really, we're not going to hold our summit this year. We're already nailing down dates for early 2019. And we've decided to go back to Santa Fe since it's the spiritual and indigenous knowledge part of our conference was so successful last time and so powerful. Yeah. We're going to go back to Santa Fe. So I think those dates, you know, there were a couple that were being thrown around, but it's going to be March or April, early April 2019. 2019. And Perfect. Look at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance website because real soon we'll put those dates up and we'll allow people to sign up even a year in advance. We like to, you know, plan way ahead and we're looking forward to it. It's going to be really great. Nan from Taos says, hi, Greg and Bill. Just wanted to say hi and that all of this is really interesting. I'm all excited for the new season. Thank you. You bet, Nan. Pretty sure Nan did Seed School Online. We were talking earlier, Greg, the feedback I'm getting personally. You know, maybe people that hated the course never come up to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good sample space, but very sincere, very yeah. intelligent, very powerful people have been coming up to me. I'm starting to sound like Mr. President, right? <laughs> have been coming up to me and saying, wow, it really was good yeah. and it really helped. And that makes me feel good. We worked long and hard on that on Seed School Online. And I'm really proud of the work that we did together, Greg, about that because it wouldn't have happened without you. And we just well, kept thanks. doing it again and again and it kept getting better, you know? Yeah. So. Wendy yeah. Sue from Hayward, Wisconsin says, you were talking about gluten-free grains. Corn and wheat are gluten-free, question mark. Corn is gluten-free. Wheat is not. And then she says, right. are, there, are there any other grains that are good for gluten-free? Oats. But a gluten and oats. There's just a very little bit. That's right. My wife has decided she can have and handle just a little bit. And again, I just heard a paper by a professor at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, say that both emmer and einkorn are way lower in gluten. They still have some. Mm -hmm. And that if they are prepared as bread through a, a 48 or 24 hour ferment process, the sourdough process, that they're now documenting 97% oh, less wow. gluten. Wow. That, that was the number she came up with, so which was really exciting. To the point where there are even some celiac People, I've been told that celiac can't have any, zero, that that 3% would be harmful. But it's more complicated than that. And this yeah. is what we, the smoking gun hasn't been found yet that actually causes all these problems. And it has to do with gluten tides, they're calling them. And those can be modified through the yeast in the fermentation process. So we'll just leave it at that. And I think it's up to everybody to take responsibility if you've got gut problems and gluten sensitivity to start to figure this out. But boy, there's a lot of evidence that people can move back into the, the heritage grains and get way less gluten. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I want you to do, I want you to take five minutes 
And we've talked a lot about C School Online tonight. Just tell people what we cover in each week. Am I putting you on the spot too much? Well, no, not really. You know, the program itself overall was designed to do three things. It's to address the why. Why should you save seeds? What's going on, you know, as far as its productiveness, but Mm -hmm. also in the world, that sort of the historical context that we find ourselves in the 21st century. And that's around the belief that if you don't understand why really you're doing this and why it's really important, then, you know, you might peter out. I mean, people are changing their lives around seed saving. It's because they understand why. So we do that. And then the how. How do you actually do it? And so we go into a lot of practical advice, especially mm-hmm. around the easier to save things so that you know where to start, especially if you're a beginner. We talk about the complications that arise in outcrossing crops. We go into basic terminology that you'll need to be a seed person along those lines. We get into the craft of it, I call it, when you get into the harvest and cleaning and storage of seeds. How do you do that? And then the third thing we approach is sharing. Mm -hmm. If you're a seed saver, you're going to end up with more seeds than Mm -hmm. you can use. That's just what happens. Yeah. You know, so how do you engage with your family, the people around you, your community, and the world at large? How can you be a responsible seed citizen with your seeds? And so we go into that a bit in the end. So that's the three general areas, and we do seven modules to do that. And so, you know, we could go, do you want me to go into each module uh, individually? That sort of covers how it takes place. And again, I've got about 28 years experience or more, 30 years experience teaching people how to save seeds. That was all rolled into, in 2010, into a six-day, seven-day course Mm -hmm. where people learn all those things. And we've done about, I don't know, 30 of those courses now. And then those were the best of what we found through our feedback and experience doing those courses was then distilled into Seed School Online. So it's really kind of a highly evolved product. This is not happenstance. This isn't somebody sitting back dreaming up an online course so they can make money from home. You know, that's not what this was about. And so it's really, I'm really, again, proud of of how it all came together. It was a lot more work than I thought it was going to (laughs) be to do it. Way more work, Yeah. you know. But now that it's done and it's there, I think it's valuable. So, yeah, it's good. Well, cool. Let me just check the questions one more time. Wendy Sue says thanks, and it looks like that's about it. So any okay. parting thoughts, Bill? Well, again, there's never been a more important time to get involved in this. And I've never been involved in anything that keeps surprising me. Again, I just went through eight buckets of seeds from a seed steward that spent the, it, the best part of his productive life doing this. And what's so great about it is that I can hold all of Ampetu's work in my hands, you know, Mm. and and pass it on to others. And just think about what you're doing today in your life. The work that you did today, you know, if you were involved in growing and saving seeds, you could pass that on to other people. Literally, physically, they could be handed the fruits of your labor. I mean, it's hugely satisfying when you get into that level. So, yeah, that's my parting thought. I've just, I've never been more excited to go out into my own yard and do this more, you know? And I've been doing this for a long time, and I just keep getting re-excited about it. So I hope you you will too, everybody out there, and I hope you'll pass the word. There's some real magic in here, and now we have the tools. Everybody can do this. So it's exciting. Thank you, Bill. You can find Seed School Online at seedschoolonline.com. You can find out information on Grain School and the next teacher training on which website, Bill? RockyMountainSeeds.org. RockyMountainSeeds.org. Well, thank you very much for this evening, Bill. I appreciate it. And we will see you again next month. We'll do yes. This, uh, we do this every month. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for spending almost an hour with us of your precious time. I know that there's a bunch of you out there and I appreciate that you would choose to spend it with Bill and I. Thank you everybody. And as I like to say, farm out and we will catch you on the flip side. Growing plants that thrive in your yard is a lot easier than you think. It starts with saving your own seeds and letting them remember what they already learned. Just text seeds to 33444 or visit IWantToSaveSeeds.com and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. 
You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.